If Kirby didn't say Poyo, Good sir, I would prefer if you did not steal the food from Dreamland. Next one. Just imagine a certain item in his hand. Good sir, I'm going to stab you to death for stealing food from Dreamland. <clears throat> hey King Dedede, die! <laughs> oh shit! Ah! You, oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh, there's the opener. Ah, safe. Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> I got. I need to show this. I need to show you this. Welcome back, friends. Lost Gav here, and this is four months, uh, four four weeks worth of facial hair not getting shaved. And hair been like, I don't know, seven months since it's not been cut? So today I took a shot in the spine. So that's great. Honestly, it, it was good timing because my back was hurting for three days straight. So hopefully this helps. We'll see. After that, I don't know what I got to do. I have no idea. But it's been getting really bad lately and I don't know what to do. Because this was the third and final. You can only do three epidurals a year because you're putting steroids in your spine. And we'll see what happens after that. Um, after that, it's most likely a micro disectomy. I think that's what I want to do first before we do a full disectomy and then a fusion. Fusion is the end of the game. That's the last thing you can do. And then that's it. And then it's just, I guess, settle the case. And there you go right there. Everyone's seeing dollar signs. Everyone's like, you're going to make a million dollars. I'm like, I'd rather not have a back I can't use. I'd rather that. I'll be honest with you. Uh, money's not what I'm thinking about right now. The person in pain isn't thinking about the money. They never do because, well, they're in pain. Um, let's see what happens. Man, it'd be a bad time to get the COVID now, that's for sure. Like, my back is just not working out. Th there's the thing that sucks about this back issue is laying in bed makes it worse. Uh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I can't do anything. It's really frustrating. All right, so these vlogs are me talking about what's going on with me. What's going on in my head? You get basically the world view of Scarf every week. That's what's happening. I'm just reflecting, thinking about past versions of me and things that were better and things that were worse. And probably the best version, but one of the best parts of me was probably the optimism. That definitely was a better thing. A part of me that just thought anything was possible and I could achieve anything to an extent, of course. But thinking that I could pull off some crazy things and I always just believed in other people and... I was a very inspiring person when I was younger. I think that's how I attracted all the women that I've been with. Um, I was I was also just bolder. I went after women. I uh, ah, that just sounds weird, doesn't it? I was a huge flirt. I flirt. I flirted a lot back in the day. I don't flirt as much now because just the game's different. But I used to flirt a lot back in the day, and I and it's how I got my girlfriends. Because I was very, not aggressive, but I was, uh, what's the word here without, because I don't think aggressive is the right word. It was, I just, I don't just talk to the person a lot. That's just the best way to put it. Without being clingy, I think if I can put it that way. I think now I'm just way more clingy because I'm older and more scared of death. So I'm more clingy to people. I think that is. Well, at the same time, not being around people as much. It's weird. Back in the day, I made sure to talk to everyone I knew all the time, every day. And when it came to the, to the women, I made extra sure I talked to them every day. Uh, and then at some point, I think it's after all my relationships and heartbreak and all that, I've gotten a lot more reclusive, where I talk to people just less in general. I can consider a lot of people my friends, but I just don't talk to them as much as you would consider a friend to talk to people, as far as I know. I have people I haven't talked to in two years, but I still think of them as a friend. It's just we haven't done anything in two years. The other thing is, the older you get, the concept of the time is different. Where I can't believe it's been two years. It feels like it's only been a couple months or something. It's like, it's been two years. Damn. All right. Because I, re I recognize this because I'm trying to do the podcast again. And it's like, holy crap, I haven't talked to these people in months or a year plus. It's just crazy. Crazy. And yeah. Oh, so right now we're looking for guests for the podcast. We got Verb for the first one. And now it's just talking 
trying to get a hold of other people, trying to get a hold of strangers, trying to get a hold of friends and things like that. I don't want to, the thing is I have friends I haven't talked to in a long time. Like, I don't really want the first thing I say to them to be like, Hey, you want to get on the podcast? I don't, I don't know. Or is it just, yeah, try to get them on the podcast. Cause it's a chance to talk to them again. It's a chance to bridge that gap of time that, that has just come up through just time. So it's a chance to bridge that gap, I suppose. So I shouldn't be too scared of it, but at the same time I am, because I don't want someone to think that I'm just using them, but I, I don't know. Like, in a way, the podcast is an excuse to talk to people uh, that I haven't talked in a long time, besides it being an excuse to talk to people I've never talked to before. I guess the best way to put it is, the podcast is an excuse to talk to people, which is a good thing, because it'd be good to be more social and just to learn more from other people. So it's not a bad thing at all. Thanks to the podcast, I've talked to developers i talked to i think it's this last year i don't remember but i talked to asymmetric who made west of loathing and kingdom of loathing which are games i love to death getting to talk to the founder and i can't remember he's a founding member who was there around the start getting to talk to them was magical it was amazing because i love their stuff so much it was great getting to talk to shell in the pit was really cool because i've been a fan of his music for years i've been playing his games for years around the start of the channel i've been playing his game the games that he's been done music for so it was really awesome to hear his music and, and talk to him. And it was just great. I was really happy about that. So I get to talk to people that I've wanted to talk to. That's why I'm, I emailed uh, House House, which is developers of Untitled Goose Game. game. I got no response. So I'm going to try DMing them next. And I might still get no response. And after that, I just, I think I give it up for a while. And then maybe try again, maybe email individuals and see if I can pull that off there. While that's happening, trying to talk, talk to people, uh, former guests of the podcast, but also just uh, people who've never been on the podcast as well. See if I can get anyone. People that I've been associated with in the past and things like that. I, okay, I'm going to admit something. I have friends who are cam girls. And I think it'd be interesting to interview one. I don't know... It'd be an interesting conversation, of course, because it tries to be family friendly. It wouldn't be too specific, but it would still be interesting to talk about that. I think it would be fascinating to talk about that. I just don't know how you would go about talking about that subject while also being, you know, uh, obviously it can't be, I don't know, obviously kids can't, kids can't necessarily hear about it, but um, there's got to be a way you can talk about more older subjects without it having to be that you kids are blocked from it but then again they wouldn't understand the concept i don't know i don't know i guess you could think how would i introduce this to my niece well obviously i wouldn't how can you introduce only fans to your niece like the concept of that or the concept of well what you do is you introduce them to the concept of that to a lesser degree not to that degree itself but to a lesser degree you're like uh well you know there's kid youtubers and these kids uh they're on camera and they're doing these things and they get money for it. Like, you have kids doing reviews with toys, so they're playing with toys and everything. So the adult version is just adults playing with adult toys. Uh, more aggressively. I think that's how I'd explain it, and that sounds horrible at the same time now, doesn't it? Hmm. And again, just thinking about that analogy just now, I guess that's what it is. It's adult. <laughs> it's adults with toys, just way more aggressive about it. Yeah, yeah. Is the go-to question whether or not they've used a bad dragon? And has that ruined them? Like, is that a go-to question to ask? I kind of think it is. I think you have to ask that question. I, I, okay. okay. I know someone who has a bad dragon. And they use it. I have not asked them if it has ruined them uh, for normal, normal-sized things. I don't think you should ever ask them that. But at the same time, how can you not be curious, I suppose? If you don't know what a bad dragon is, good for you, don't look it up. Though you kind of get the context of what it is from what I've been saying. That is a magical thing about uh, anything when it comes to adult stuff, where you could be like, you could mention a name, or you recognize something, and it's on the other person whether or not they acknowledge it. Because if it does, then it outs them as they know what that is. That's always the fun game. Because I remember, was it, uh, there's a shirt. Someone had a shirt. And I think the shirts, no, that was, it was a mug. It was a mug. I don't know why I said shirt. I was going to say the Ahoy Gotham, but it's not that. It was a mug. 
I think the mug said like Yif juice, juice or something like that. And so the it's like, all right, anyone who they'd have to out themselves to recognize what that what that mug says. Also, that's a ridiculous mug when you think about it. But still, it's a mug. It's like, huh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> You can I I feel like there is a level of maturity with the with the Huego shirts and jackets. And that is it's just a very much I want to just trigger people kind of thing, and it just feels very childish to me. I I can't help but think, yeah, it's just a very childish thing. The Huego shirts and the Huego jackets and all that. Um they're just dumb, honestly. I've seen a couple of them. I saw maybe two or three at Comic Con. I hear they're way more common at Anime Con, which makes perfect sense when you think about it. They're just dumb to me. I don't really see the the point. To, like uh, it's it's just a triggering thing. That's what it is at the end of the day. It's just a triggering thing. That's all those shirts are. It's just an attempt to get a response, and it's hilarious, I guess. But I just like mm, okay. I think. Oh yeah, what was I talking about? Yeah, younger more. Uh, I was talking about younger me and the funner parts and the less so fun parts. The funner parts was just, I was more of a motivated person. I like motivating others. And I'm sure that's what attracted others to me. That's what really happened there as I got young, as I was younger. But as I've gotten older, the world has definitely made me more jaded and more cynical. And made me more wounded. I think the best word is wounded. Because I didn't know what the pain the world could do to a person as I was growing up. And then injuries were inflicted upon me. So... I slowly just got to understand more about what horribleness can happen to somebody. Um, of course, my stuff is nothing compared to like some way worse things, but I've had some bad things happen to me done by other people. After all, I've nearly been beaten to death for one. Um, I got, well, certainly that's probably the worst one. <laughs> uh, of course, another one is the whole thing with the reason why I don't do neuroscience anymore. That's another one. It's a horrible thing that happened there. I just betrayal and all that stuff. Love life. Things have gone up and down. There's plenty of things happened there. I've seen some really bad relationships to my friends that have definitely jaded me about some things as well. Very much jaded me about some things. And some things happened to me that weren't so great. Uh, this car accident, obviously just things by accident just happen to people. And then that's, for some people, they're just dead from car accidents, and other people are just wounded and don't get away, get a, get better from it, like me, and things like that. And then there's just, well, politics. Politics beats you down and just makes you cynical. I feel like it can only make you cynical, or it can only make you a raging lunatic who doesn't make any sense. Because it becomes a game of, oh yeah, we're winning kind of thing. And I just, mm, not a big fan of that. Not a big fan of that at all. I just think about politics for my entire life. Has it ever been positive overall? And one could argue that if it's your side, then maybe. I don't know. When I was a child, there was, of course, Bush, first one, and I have no memory of that. When I got older, Clinton happened. You had all the Lewinsky stuff and all that stuff. I don't know much about Clinton to this day. All I know is when Columbine happened... He did like 39 bombings that day because a lesson in politics is never not take advantage of a tragedy. So while Columbine happened, they bombed the hell out of whatever country it was, because I don't remember at the moment anymore, but they did a record number of bombings that day because they knew those bombings were not going to be noticed while Columbine was happening. That's a trip thing right there. And of course, you of course got... George Bush, and you had the WMD situation, and Afghanistan, and Iraq, and all that stuff, 9-11, Katrina, just a lot of things happening, and you got to see just how inept uh, Bush was at times, and also just how we straight up were lied to get into a war, which is very unfortunate, and just a lot of bad things there after that, and then of course you have Guantanamo Bay and all those things, after that you got... Obama, a lot of positiveness going on there. People really believed. I was in college at the time, so of course where I was was swept up in all of that stuff. There were change posters everywhere. It was like, did you vote and all this stuff? Everywhere. Everyone wanted to vote for Obama and all this stuff. And like, I liked the candidates. I liked McCain and I liked Obama. And then it came down, we'll make the vote. And well, Palin's the reason why I didn't vote McCain. I know a lot of Republicans who didn't vote McCain because of Palin. 
I know a bunch of Republicans who they're like, I could not, I couldn't make that vote. I couldn't make that vote because once he's dead, it's her up and then what? So they're like, no, like that was bad. And they would have gladly voted for him if Lieberman, Lieberman was there. And yeah, it's was like, oof. so Obama just beat McCain pretty bad. Here's the thing. Here's the thing I didn't know, though. I thought that was like, because ignorance of the past, ignorance of history and politics and everything, I thought that was like the biggest trouncing in history. I thought that was the biggest one. I really did, because I don't know anything. There is an election, besides, of course, uh, George Washington, where it was a landslide. And that landslide is none other than Tricky Dick Nixon. And let me just get the exact numbers here. So 1972, I think this is the one. 1972, Richard Tricky Dick Nixon versus George McGovern. Well, Nixon was California, huh? McGovern, South Car Dakota, really? Okay, so with his running mate was uh, Spiro Agnew. I think uh, the only people who know who Spiro Agnew is are politics people or just barely because of Futurama had Agnew in it. So Nixon carried 49 states, 520 electoral votes, popular vote, 47 million, percentage 60.7% of that. So the Democrat was George McGovern, 17 electoral colleges. He got, I think it was, it's not I think he got Massachusetts, yeah, he got Massachusetts and DC. That's how he got his 17. He got 29 million votes, though. So his votes were all over the place, but they were just eclipsed by the Republican votes. So just, yeah, California was Republican uh, during this vote. Florida was Republican. Everything was Re Republicans won that, and it was 47 million. To 29 million. Sure, a ton of people voted for him, but still, that's a trouncing right there. That is a trouncing. 1972. When the hell was Watergate, by the way, is a question I need to ask myself. But still, that is ridiculous. Real quick, when was Watergate? Just just so we all know, just so we're on the same page here. When was that? Vietnam War. So right, space was 72. Watergate scandal was right after. What? Watergate was right after? Yeah, all right. Hey, that's something. And then Nixon was out uh, two years later. Okay. Then he got pardoned by Gerald Ford. Huh. Wait, why is it Ford and not Agnew? Wait, now I think about it. Because he, uh, he got, he resigned. Did Agnew resign with him? How did Ford get the presidency? I don't remember this part of history anymore. Oh, man, I do not remember this part of his history anymore at all. I'm not going to look it up now, obviously, because we're all right here. But, um, yeah, that is a trouncing. That is, that is something else. So, so Obama beats um, McCain. And while we're here, I may as well just go for it. Where the hell is it? Uh, 1976. Yeah, it's Jimmy Carter beat Gerald Ford. Huh. And in that one, again, California was Republican. 1980, we're doing some history now all of a sudden. So 1980, California was Republican again, but it's no no surprise on this one because it's Ronald Reagan. So yeah, everyone's going to vote Reagan on that one. 1988, oh wow, Reagan did better than Nixon. Forget what I said. So Reagan took 525 electoral college, 13 went to Walter Mondale. I forgot about Walter Mondale. Mondale got... Uh, let's see here. Is that, where is that one? That's not North Dakota. What is that? He got Minnesota. He got Minnesota, which was his home state, and D.C. Apparently, D.C. keeps voting for the loser. And there's 54 million to 37 million. This is rounding down. Mondale got the Minnesota and D.C. So again, just Republicans just dominated America for a long time. And then again, with the, so... This is an interesting thing is Republicans have had a lot of control over the country for a lot of a lot of time during even my parents' uh, lives. And then you got W. Bush. This is where the Democrats are starting to take some control away from the Republicans. 48 million to 41 million, so it's getting closer. 1992, you've got Clinton. First time California's been Democrat in a long time. 
So it's amazing that for when people think Democrat, they think California. But it wasn't until 1980, is 1992 when that actually happened. A big part of that, though, is Ross Perot. Ross Perot took a lot of votes away from the Republicans. And so because of that, you can actually thank Ross Perot most likely for why Democrats won that one, because they were split between Ross Perot and George W. Bush. George H.W. Bush. That is a trip, though. Again, D.C. went for two other Democrats. D.C. apparently very Democratic. Then it was once again, Ross Perot was in it with Bob Dole and Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton won by 8 million as far as popular vote goes, but he just dominated Electoral College. Electoral, electoral College is important, of course. That is why gerrymandering is so important. That's why, that's why I don't like gerrymandering. I don't think it should be a thing because it's just not really making it true. Still, even if you want for a popular vote, uh, should win it. Uh, there are... a Actually, more times than not, the Democrats would win more times on popular vote than an electoral college. It's interesting how uh, Trump was basically going to, he was just talking crap about the electoral college the entire election until he won. Then he thanked it, basically. That's what Trump freaking did. And then, of course, we have uh, Al Gore versus George W. Bush. It's interesting Al Gore hasn't been brought up. It's probably because he lost to Bush and no one wants to bring him up. But even if Al Gore was in the Democratic election, this year, he'd be younger than everyone else that was up there. It's kind of ridiculous. Then you've got Bush versus John Kerry, and it was close. Like, Bush versus Al Gore was within 500,000 votes, elect uh, popular-wise. When it was John Kerry versus Bush, it was within 3 million popular votes, but uh, Bush beat him by 35 electoral college. Again, California being a big factor in a lot of those votes. And then we get over to 2008, which is Obama versus McCain. So this is the one where I thought was just the biggest trouncing in history. Because that's how small my scope is. And so, yeah, he beat him pretty good, though. 365 electoral votes to 173 electoral votes. Obama had about 28 uh, states, while McCain had 22 states. Obama beat him by 10 million votes. 69 nice million votes for Obama. 59 million for, uh, for McCain. And the colors are all over the place. Then you go over to 2016, and then Obama barely pulls it out. 65 million to 61 million, basically. Obama gets 26 states in D.C. to 24, but he wins by 332 to 206. Did Obama win by more? No, he did not. He won by a closer margin, but it's not that much of a closer margin. You see, a lot of people are just voting as it's going forward. And then we go over to 2016. And in this one, Hillary wins by, th by 3 million votes uh, popular-wise. She got 227 electoral, electoral votes, and then Trump got 304. She got 20 states and then D.C., and he got 30 states. So Trump was just like, the Electoral College is crap. It's not worth it. It's not great. We should get rid of it. And then he wins because of Electoral College. He's like, oh, okay, I'm taking that back. I'm not. I was always for Electoral College. That's the kind of thing that happened there. Now, here's the thing. Like, for me, what I didn't like was when we got to this point, to this election, it was like, was it Nate Silver's site? or well, like, uh. 358 or whatever it's called. His whole thing was, look, or two, I can't remember what his website's called at the moment. But his whole thing is he gives Trump like 30% chance of winning. And everyone got this false sense of security. They're like, there's no way Hillary's going to lose to Trump. That's not going to happen. No freaking way. Not possible. And because of that, there was some slow going. There was some slow going on the Democratic side to win this thing. People, like, they were not as high, like they could, there as much energy as was put into selection, there was room for more. But some people uh, were cool on their heels, including Clinton, because there were states she should have gone to, but she didn't go to them to fight for. And in the end, she lost. She didn't get the state she needed to get, and she lost the election. I remember watching it. I'm like, okay, she can still win, but it's looking not too great. I'm like, oh god, we're screwed. And. Look at the last four years, and you can decide what you think about it. I think, overall, it's been a disaster in a lot of ways. There have been some positives as well, but 
the virus has happened. Now, a funny thing I mentioned before is if you wrote a book about this election, like a fictional book, obviously, if you wrote a book about just someone who just the landscape for them to become president and just all the crap they've done, all the really awful stuff they've done, and then the fact that they got rid of the group that would have helped them was COVID-19. If you wrote a book, thematically, what happens at the end of that book? The president gets the virus and dies from it. Because that would teach some irony or ironic lesson or thing like that. That's what you would do. But that is a story. That is fantasy. In real life, I can, I unless it actually happens, I would guarantee Trump catches it or has already caught it and he'll be asymptomatic. I can guarantee that. I have friends who are Republicans. And they hope to God, to God, and without irony, that he gets the virus and he gets sick from it. Not kill him, but he gets sick from it. Because for them, they believe that if Trump gets sick from the virus and he has a little bit of trouble with it, he'll understand and then he'll be better about dealing with the virus. So yeah, there are Republicans who want him to get sick so we can recognize the problem. Because that's what it takes for Trump. He doesn't have empathy. He only has what's going on with me. So if he gets sick, then maybe, maybe he would actually have some more empathy for everyone else. Because now he understands it. That seems to be what happens with him is if he actually gets a better understanding of a situation, he sometimes does not shit choice. So, bleh. The truth of the matter is, and this is this is why you get more cynical, and because as you get older, you kind of need to pay attention to more politics and everything. Is You get more cynical because of politics. I don't think you can possibly get more optimistic from politics. Because you kind of just see how crap everyone is. And how openly crap they are, and yet they're rewarded for it. And it makes you just feel less about doing the right thing. And you hear the statements from people that are like, those are in power or those of evil depend on those of good playing by the rules. They depend on the good to hold themselves down by standard. And that is a very unfortunate thing, and it's a very believable thing. And I understand why that has made me more cynical. That makes me less hopeful. But when you're less hopeful and you're more cynical, you're not very fun to be around. And because of that, I try to keep an eye for wonder and merriment and all that stuff. So I try to stay positive as best I can. But I know deep down, I've seen examples of negative things. And I think that's why probably a lot of older people are just more jaded and cynical and everything. And they're just kind of not fun to be around because they've seen a lot of bad things. And they've seen bad things be rewarded and good things not be rewarded. And they're like, screw it, I don't have the energy to be good anymore. And I understand that. I get that. And I would rather fight against that. But that ain't an easy path to take at all, for sure. But it is probably the more worthy path, but it may not be the most rewarding path, at least from the outside in. From the inside out, maybe it is more rewarding to try to take the good path. But that comes down to, just for everyone, what that is, and whether it's worth it or not. And I'll say this one more cynical thing, but not meaning to be cynical, but I guess it is, and that is the soul. I feel like the concept of the soul is to give us hope for what comes next. Honestly, what else can it possibly be? Because if the soul is a thing, if that is real, then that means whatever is happening, hopefully there's something better after this point. I think that's really what it is. It's just like, well, I was miserable here. If I still exist in the next thing, I hope it's a better thing than this kind of situation there. And so you, is the belief in the soul. But at the same time, I think it's the people who truly believe in that are the people who have been miserable and hope for a better uh, situation going forward. Um, because, well, things weren't so great here, so maybe things will be better in the next thing. And so it gives hope. The hope of the next life and the hope of finding something better in this life, uh, those two hopes are what keep people going, I would say. I think that's kept me going a lot of times, is just the hope of well, as long as I'm alive, something better can happen in my life. As miserable as it, been, as, as it has been at times, there's always a chance for something better. There's always a chance that something more can happen. Also a chance for something worse, but also a chance for something better. 
Whereas, well, if you die, then you just have to hope there is something next. You, but you'll never know. You don't know until you find out. Well, as there's people who don't believe in any of that stuff, they're very nihilistic and they do whatever the hell they want and make everyone else miserable. Maybe even make themselves miserable. Nihilism has never been really fun to me. I've never found a fun nihilist. I knew a lot of nihilists in college. They were miserable f***s. That's... I... T doesn't make sense, but just like... There's no good way to put it. They were miserable f***s. That's what they were. They were just miserable people to be around. I was like, it's not fun. Not fun. Not even a misery loves company kind of way. It's just not fun people to be around. Not at all. Cynicism can be okay, because cynicism sometimes is the right play, but it also can be very miserable. Now, before I get cyclical about this and just go back to the start, uh, we'll stop there. Let me see, what's the time here? This is why I should always look at the time. 30 minutes. Okay. So, oh, my throat. Hmm. So, um, that right there is the vlog. Is there anything else really quick? No, I think that's it. So there you go. That's the vlog. I had fun hot. Ah, I had fun talking. I hope you had fun watching and listening. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Having fun. Thanks for coming by and see you next time. <laughs>